I'm very grateful to my Heavenly Father, brothers and sisters, for the opportunity of attending this uh, history-making conference and for the wonderful outpouring of his spirit. I think of the words of Nephi of old. He saw our day. He saw the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. He saw the power of God. He saw the saints gathered upon the face of the whole earth and the power of God resting upon them in great glory. Is there anything else like it in all this world as we gathered here and the buildings filled overflowing and the adjoining buildings and then with our priesthood meeting last night being broadcast all over the world? The power of God is in this work. It's his kingdom established in the earth for the last time never to be thrown down or given to another people. And we have his decree that it shall roll forth until it should become as a great mountain and fill the whole earth. I thank the Lord for the testimonies of these men to whom we've listened, servants of the living God. And I'm sure that each one of us who's living in tune with the Spirit have received a witness in our souls to the effect that they are true servants of our Father in heaven. Uh, Brother Benson referred to a statement made by President Kimball in our meeting with the regional representatives of the 12 last Thursday. I thought he did a magnificent job in laying out before us the command of the Lord through his servants for the responsibility that's ours to share this gospel with every nation under heaven. Sometimes I think we get a little too satisfied with our own membership and our own surroundings and that we're not as eager to share with others as we ought to be. And then we have had presented to us today or in the conference the ministry of the Master. I like particularly Brother Hunter's narration of his life and labors. And then Brother Ashton followed with a reminding us of the parable of the five wise and five foolish virgin, virgins and called attention to the fact that we should not be among the foolish ones, but that we should be prepared when the master would come, that we were prepared to meet him. And then I had this thought that I'd like to say a few words to you about today, and that is I'm a great believer in the prophecies. I thank the Lord for the Holy Scriptures. What would we know about our Father in heaven and his great plan for us, his children here upon this earth, and what awaits us after we have finished our life's work here in mortality if we didn't have the scriptures? Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, for they are they which testify of me. And we've had testimony here in this conference of how they did testify of him, even to the minutest detail of casting lot for his clothing at the time of his crucifixion. As he walked along the way by two of his disciples as they were on their way to Emmaus and were told that their eyes were holden, that they didn't recognize him, and when he heard what they had to say about him and his ministry and his resurrection, he realized that they didn't understand what he'd been trying to teach them. And then he said, O oh, fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And commencing with Moses and the prophets, he showed them how that the prophets had testified of him. And then Peter tells us that he opened their understandings, that is, the understanding of these disciples with whom he was traveling, that they might understand the scriptures. We have thousands, at least I think thousands, at least a thousand different churches in the world today <laughs> because they don't understand the scriptures and they're teaching for doctrine the precepts of men and therefore necessary for a restoration. I like the words of the apostle Peter. He said that we have a more sure word of prophecy and we do well that we cleave unto it as unto a light shining in a dark place until the day star rise in our hearts, knowing this, that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation for prophecy came not 
in old time by the will of men, but holy men of old spake as they were moved upon by the power of the Holy Ghost. That being true, we have a more sure word of prophecy that makes the Bible to me like a blueprint where the Lord has outlined everything from the war in heaven up to the final winding up scenes. And I think that um, that's what um, Isaiah meant when he said the Lord had declared the end from the beginning. Now, Peter must have had also in his mind the glorious experience that he just previously experienced when or the other of the brethren, the Savior ascended into heaven, and two men in white apparel stood, and they said, Why gaze ye men, why stand ye men gazing, thus gazing into heaven? Know ye not that this same Jesus, which is taken from you into heaven, shall again appear in like manner as you have seen him ascend? And then I have this thought that I'd like to say just a few words about, and that is that not only should we prepare our own lives to be prepared when he comes like the five wise virgins, but think of what the prophets have foretold that should precede his second coming so that we not be in the dark, so that we could understand. I give you the words of Peter following the day of Pentecost when he spoke to those who had put to death the Christ. He said, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send unto you Jesus Christ, who before was preached unto you, whom the heavens must receive until the time of the restitution of all things spoken by the mouths of all the holy prophets since the world began. I don't know where you can go anywhere in this world outside of this church and find a declaration of a restitution of all things and not just a reformation. And that until there is that restitution of all things spoken by the mouths of all the holy prophets, we just can't believe that Peter was a prophet of God and look for the coming of the Savior. And then it makes you wonder why the world doesn't understand and why they're not willing to listen when we declare a restitution of all things. I like a little statement in Malachi. It seems to me that Malachi's whole book was written almost regarding our day and time, about the tithing that Brother Taylor just talked about, about the coming of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord to turn the hearts of the fathers, the children of the hearts, the children of the fathers. And in the third chapter, he starts out by saying, Behold, I will send my messenger to prepare the way for my coming. And... Um, then he goes on to say that the Lord whom he seeks shall suddenly come to his temple, and he shall come cleansing and purifying his refiner's fire and fuller soap. Now, I don't think that was referring to his first coming. He didn't come swiftly to his temple, and he, well, all men were able to abide the day of his first coming, and uh, he didn't come cleansing and purifying his refiner's fire and fuller soap, but we're told that when he comes in the latter days, that the wicked will cry out, let the rocks fall upon us to hide us from his presence. Then I say to you and to all the world, where is that messenger that the Lord, speaking through Malachi, said he would send to prepare the way for his coming? And I refer to his second coming. Now to us Latter-day Saints, we know that that messenger was none other than the prophet Joseph Smith. He didn't choose himself. He went out in the woods reading the words of James, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given to him. And he didn't know which church to join. And when he went, the heavens were opened unto him. Brother Kim, President Kimball has outlined in one of his talks today how the prophets of old communed how the Lord communed to the prophets of old. God isn't dead. He reigns in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. 
This is his work and his glory. This is the dispensation when, he, as Paul said, when he should bring together in one in Christ all that which is in heaven above and that which is in the earth beneath. In other words, it's the time when he'll finish his work upon this earth preparatory to his second coming here. And, um, and so if he was to send a messenger to prepare the way for his coming, where in all the world can you find that messenger? Remind you that messengers sent of God are never self-sent. Paul said, faith comes by the hearing of the word of God. And how shall they hear except it be preached unto them? And how shall they preach except they be sent? And so Joseph Smith, the natural first step the Lord would take to prepare the way for his second coming was to call his messenger. And a messenger called by God can be nothing other than a prophet. That's what, I, what Amos said. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And so when he called this messenger, that messenger would be nothing but a prophet. Today we sing praise to the man who communed with Jehovah. Jesus anointed that prophet and seer. Blessed to open the last dispensation, kings shall extol him and nations revere. That's what we feel toward that prophet because he wasn't sent of himself. He isn't, wasn't teaching the philosophies of men. As far as my experience goes in studying the scriptures, he's given us more revealed truth than any prophet who's ever lived upon the face of this earth except the Savior of the world. And thank the, the Lord for the marvelous truth. That helps you to understand the words of Isaiah when he said, Because this people draw near me with their mouths, but with their lips to honor me, and their hearts are far removed from me, and they teach for doctrine the precepts of men. Now where do you find those precepts of men? In all these thousands of churches all over this world. Therefore the Lord said he would proceed to do a marvelous work among the people, even a marvelous work and a wonder. And anything that's marvelous and wonderful in the eyes of the Lord must be something that every lover of truth would like to know about and like to have and clasp to his bosom. And then he said that it should cause the wisdom of their wise men to perish and the understanding of their prudent men to be hid. That's what we have. I've talked to ministers for hours and only got one question because I was explaining things to them out of God's holy book and the Bible that they never understood before in their lives. I tell you, brothers and sisters, we have the marvelous work and the wonder. Now, if we go on to the other things that the Lord saw, you'd think that the first step, if the Lord raised up a prophet and a messenger to prepare the way for his coming, the first thing he'd want to, that messenger to do would to be to correct the false impressions in the world with regard to God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. For at that time, they all thought that they were three in one, without body, without parts, without passions. And Moses knew that that condition would prevail. For when he went to lead the children of Israel into the Promised Land, he told them that they would not remain there long, but they would be scattered among the nations, and they would worship gods made by the hands of man that could neither see, nor hear, nor taste, nor smell. Just think how literally the very words spoken over 3,000 years ago by Moses was fulfilled in the doctrine that was proclaimed all over this world in all the Christian churches at the time that Joseph Smith had his marvelous vision. But Moses didn't leave it at that. He said in the latter days, and we live in the latter days, if Israel would seek after him, they would surely find him. Thank God we found him through the raising up of this prophet. And then you would think that when they revealed themselves unto him so that they understood what the Godhead really was, the next message that Joseph needed to know was when he asked which of all the churches he should join. And who in all the heavens above and the earth beneath have a better right to pronounce judgment upon the people of the world than the Savior of the world. And he answered him that he should join none of them, for they taught for doctrines the precepts of men. 
Well, now there isn't going to be time to you know, outline very much more, but just think of what followed. Think of Moroni coming. Think of the plates from which the Book of Mormon were translated. Where in all the world does anybody know about that other record that the Lord commanded Ezekiel should be written, and that he would bring it forth and put it with the record of Judah and make them one in his hand? We're the only people in the world that know where that record is. And just think what it contains of true knowledge. The Lord preserved it for the convincing of the Jew and the Gentile that Jesus is the Christ. And the Jew, even the Jew today, doesn't need to search any further than to go to the Book of Mormon because that gives the sign of his birth and of his crucifixion and then of his visit, as we've been told, to this land of America. And then the vision that Nephi saw when he saw Mary with child and saw that child grow to manhood, saw him crucified for the sins of the world. You see, all we need to do is to look to the blueprint that the Lord has prepared through his prophets. And then if you take the next steps, the coming of John the Baptist with the Aaronic priesthood, the power to baptize by immersion for the remission of sins, and there wasn't anybody in this world holding that power when John the Baptist restored it to these men and taught them how to baptize each other. And then Moses, no, and then Peter, James, and John brought the Melchizedek priesthood, power of the holy apostleship, the power to organize the church and kingdom of God in the earth for the last time, never to be thrown down or given to another people. And then the coming of Moses that caused the gathering of Latter-day Israel. I like the statement of Jeremiah. He said, Turn unto me, O backsliding children, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion, and I will give you pastors after mine own heart, and they shall teach you with knowledge and with understanding. Where could you go in all the world and listen to pastors after his own heart like you've listened here in this conference? And they are God called and ordained, and they are the pastors that he spoke of. And then Jeremiah also said that he would send for many fishers and many hunters, and they should fish them and hunt them from the hills the mountains and the holes in the rocks. And that's what we've been doing. He saw the day when it should no more be said as sure as God lives, who led Israel up out of Egypt, out of bondage and captivity, but as sure as God lives, with gathered Israel from the four quarters of the earth. And as he said, one of a city and two of a family. And that accounts for this great conference that we're being held here today. Now, that's just a little bit of it. God bless you, brothers and sisters. And <laughs> My time's up. I don't know why we should hesitate to raise our voice and testimony to me. It's a marvelous work and a wonder. It's the greatest movement in all this world. When everything else passes away like the dream of a night's vision, this, pro this program, this kingdom will be going on to its decreed destiny. And that's my witness and testimony to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.